Hello everyone, my name is Abuna Isaac Berry, the host of this session, like this dude who's always the host of these sessions. And today, I will be interviewing him. He's named Rifat Bari, or Rifat Upperball Berry, or Rifat Albert Berry. He has a lot of names, you know. So, today we're going to be interviewing him on his new paper. His paper had just been accepted into a major science journal whose name we cannot disclose. It's on the action principle. But uh, first of all, can you talk more about your paper? Yeah, sure. So my paper, as you said, is about the action principle, or as it's uh, more can formally you known as the principle of least action or the stationary principle. Can you tell us what it's about in uh, layman terms? Yeah, sure. Uh, the action principle is um, reformulation of classical mechanics, in, uh, which was created by Lagrange. So Lagrange was a famous mathematician in the 1800s. I think we've all heard of Lagrange. Yes, Joseph Louis Lagrange. And uh, he took Newton's equations, so Newton's equations, uh, to employ Newton's uh, formulas, you need to know where a particle is at some time and with what velocity that particle is moving. And if you know those two things, where it is right now, what its mass is, and where it's going, I know it looks like three things, but it's really two things, the mass and the velocity. If you know those two things, you can say where the particle will be at any time, right? Yeah. That's because of F equals ME, right? And from the acceleration, we can get the velocity and the position, and the position will give us the the location of the particle at any time. So what you're telling so, me is yeah. that I can predict the future using F equal ma. Right. So Lagrange came up with a entity called the Lagrangian, uh, which is also known as the action. The action. That's where the action principle comes from. And the action says that if you tell me where a particle starts and where it ends, I can tell you what path it took between the start and end points. So it's a uh, alternative to classical mechanics and it's primarily used in complicated systems like double pendulums or um, other kind of systems where you have two bodies that are coupled with each other. So for example in a double pendulum, in a single pendulum you have one object just swinging back and forth, right? Yeah. In a double pendulum you have another pendulum attached to the original pendulum and so you have this kind of swinging motion but to analyze that swinging motion you cannot use classical Newtonian mechanics you can but it's going to be uh, torture yes. well, instead you should use uh, the Lagrangian and that would um, and so my paper is basically about how can we computationally visualize uh, the action which is uh, you know mechanical energy is what what is mechanical energy? It's uh, kinetic energy plus potential energy, right? But the energy. What? No. Uh, no, I'm only okay. talking about kinetic plus potential. Oh yeah. Um, Heat, uh, sound, uh, light energy, whatever. Those are those are. By the way, I just that. wanted to comment yeah. that it's actually a, a pretty amazing that with just adding one pendulum to another, Newtonian mechanics can go to, from fun to laborious torture that will probably take you uh, weeks of work. Yeah, well, it it's happens to a lot of coupled oscillators. If you attach a spring to another spring, it gets complicated, especially if those springs are in parallel or if they're in series. You probably thought about series in parallel only for circuits, but you can also apply it for springs. Uh, and for those kinds of scenarios, you should also think about using the Lagrangian. So anyway, as I was saying, um, uh, what was I saying? So I was saying that mechanical energy is kinetic plus potential, right? Yes. The Lagrangian is kinetic minus potential. And you might ask why? Why is that? Why is the Lagrangian defined as uh, the integral of the kinetic energy minus the potential. Okay, okay, energy. I said layman's terms. Okay, yes. So that's that's pretty much it. That's that's the goal of my paper. Yeah. All right. Okay. So. 
second of all, um, so uh, second of all, can you give advice to new in the future paper writers on? Uh, yeah, uh, that's my term. Yeah. Uh, new or future authors who want to get their paper in a journal, but they just don't know what to write. Like, how should they choose what to write? Okay, so the first thing to be is, is um, and this is the most important rule. You have to be curious. Uh, because you cannot get anywhere without being curious. So of the, w the way I get inspired to write about this topic is, you know how? Uh, the action principle, I started writing this paper in January 6th. Um, and I remember the exact date because of the insurrection. Um, but it was January 6th of last year. And I happened to watch a YouTube video by Sean Carroll. He's a theoretical physicist at Caltech. And he was making a bunch of videos. And one of the videos was about the action principle. And so this video was uh, very interesting, but it was not enough to inspire me to do anything. But exactly one day after I watched that video, I saw an invitation in my email. Um, it was for a colloquium at the Museum of uh, the Museum of Math in Manhattan, the National Museum of Mathematics in Manhattan. And it was a virtual colloquium about how light bends reflects and refracts in curved surfaces so it was also about the action principle in a way and finally in, a, in my calculus class in my multivariable calculus class we talked about curvature so and it was, was pushed on you twice and then you finally got curious in, enough and uh, bored enough of it to start actually working on a paper so no i thought this was uh, something like fate i thought that you know it was probably you know, God wanted me to to pursue this, so yeah. uh, so I thought, you know, I have to do this. Uh, so I thought it was faith that you know br brought me to the action. Why are you so, smiling? Um, uh, that's that's the real reason. So anyway, so I started um I started researching about the action principle, uh, but uh, I started doing it all by myself. Uh, uh, so I started learning about uh, the Lagrangian and how it's related to classical mechanics and the different ways to visualize the Lagrangian. So, the, so just to get back to your point, the number one um, way to, to choose a topic is to be interested in the natural world. So I was interested in, in just how the world works and I stumbled into this topic. So let me just give you some ideas for, for some papers that I've seen. Uh, one paper that I saw recently is how does sunlight reflect off of the water waves on the beach? And it turns out there is some very complicated math. Okay, but you don't have to introduce that to the no, viewers. No, but that's just one idea. Another idea is when you put a straw inside a glass of water, uh, what happens is that on the other side of the straw, the, the water will completely block one end of the straw. So even though the water is a liquid, it acts like a solid. So that's another idea for a paper. So um, those are... Yeah, those are lots of ideas for papers that uh, that you can think about. So the big idea is to be curious about your world. All right. So uh, that's actually very interesting. Now, third thing, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, just correct me if I'm wrong. The process of writing a paper is one: you have to choose a name. Like for example, uh, you were named Rifat Bari and not Awesome Paper Writer Six Thousand for a reason. And, and then, number two, uh, you have to go uh, write the abstract, which is like a short summary that opens you up to the subject, but doesn't give you too much depth so that you actually have to read the paper, like a movie trailer. And then the paper, uh, it shows you the methodology, then the literature review. And then finally, we get to the results. So you have to show your results so that others can try and replicate and verify it. And then you have to find, uh, and then you have to summarize it all and mass it up in your conclusion. So is there, so can you go more in depth with that uh, process because I've never written a paper myself so I thought you would be more experienced on the subject. What section do you want me to elaborate on? Well you might want to elaborate on maybe how they could write their methodology because or their abstract actually. Okay so the abstract is um, for me the abstract was the last part even though it's the first part of the paper that you read, uh, it's the last part that I wrote because the abstract is 
um, how you tie everything together once you know what your results are how you're gonna accomplish uh, how you're going to carry out your hypothesis and your experiment once everything is uh, done and you have the results that's when you can write the abstract um, so that's what I did for my paper yeah hmm. that's interesting so on uh, now for my last question I would like to ask you so what uh, there are newspapers like for example the New York Times and then there are scientific journals so and uh, for the names of scientific journals why don't uh, sign uh, why don't uh, papers advertise themselves like articles do can you tell me that um, well papers are written for a more specialized audience so most layman people won't understand uh, what's written in papers but they you know they can try it. Um, another reason is because articles are, are blocked off for uh, the public via paywall so it's more difficult to access them than regular you know newspaper articles but the main reason is because it's um, most of the physics articles are technical and and specialized topics that, uh, that most people won't understand yeah by the way, earlier, I think I made a mistake in my paper process. A uh, literature review actually comes before the methodology, if I'm correct? So the literature review works by you look at the existing research. So for example, for my paper, I had to see what other people did to visualize the action principle. Um, so I saw a lot of people worked on something called the Brachistochrome problem. Um, and so I tried to find a gap in the literature. What was the gap? So in my case, the gap was that the formulation for the Lagrangian, uh, which as you remember was the integral of kinetic minus potential energy, was not sufficiently explained. What was the motivation behind formulating the Lagrangian in that way? So to address that gap in the literature, I created a bunch of computational visualizations. Um, so that, that's the literature review. You look at what's, what's out there, uh, you find a gap uh, in the literature, and that gap is your need, right? Why does your paper need to exist? What, what difference would it make if your paper doesn't exist? Um, what does your paper contribute to the existing research? So that's, the, that's mostly what the literature review is for. What did other people do, and what, what new thing are you bringing to the table? Wait, so I understand literature review, but what about methodol- uh, So literature review is like checking originality, right? It's about what new thing do you bring to the table. It's yeah, about, so like what review, do you- In the so, literature yeah, review, you I should see. address the need. What is the need for your paper to exist? What, uh, what gap are you addressing? What gap are you hmm. filling? So is the methodology like explaining how you got your results? Yes. So, for example, if you go to the lab and you carry out an experiment, in the methodology you have to say what materials you used, what was your procedure, um, how did you carry out the experiment. The reason a methodology needs to exist is so that the experiment can be replicated by other scientists in other labs so that your conclusions can be verified by other labs. Or your results. Your results which is the same as your conclusion. Oh. So, so that's why the methodology needs to exist, so that other scientists can verify your work and so you can say how you got your results. And obviously your results or your conclusion is you summarizing what you did and what your, your results of your methodology were, right? Yeah, so f that's for experimental physics. So oh. the, the paper I wrote was for computational physics. So I did not have to go to a lab and I didn't have to do an experiment. Instead, I had to go to my computer and make a bunch of simulations. Yes. So my methodology... Um, script? My methodology was about how I created my simulations, mm. how my simulations were programmed, were, what were the different modules in my simulation. Um, so that's what a methodology is for. Every different fields of physics will have a different kind of methodology. Experimental physics will have the obvious methodology, you have the the materials and the procedure. Computational physics, uh, like my paper, you'll try to say 
the the algorithm behind your program what is the what is the architecture of your program and the different modules that make up your program and for theoretical physics um, I don't think there uh, I don't think there is a methodology because it's it's theoretical work uh, but some papers do have methodologies even in theoretical physics so those are just just uh, that's an overview of the different methodologies in different fields. Because of your uh, elucidation, I actually have one last question. And this might seem very stupid, but can't you just copy paste all of the code from your simulations into the methodology? <laughs> Would <Wouldn't> that work? <laughs> no, because the purpose of the paper is not to copy paste your work so you know i mean what purpose would that serve right for yeah. others to try it the out the purpose of the paper is oh so that so that actually goes in the appendix oh. if you want to yeah the, some papers have an appendix where for example you can put additional figures or additional tables or additional code but um you you don't put the full actual code into the paper itself because the purpose of the paper is to kind of be uh an overview of, of a tiny research project you take. So that's the uh, that's the purpose of the of not putting your whole code in directly in the methodology. Yeah. What? So how do they exactly replicate uh, your methodology, uh, like your code? Well, my code is open source, so anyone. Oh, you're all, uh, it's all, all, all yeah, yeah anyone can take my code and, and run it in the browser and see that that it works. So for computational <gasps> for computational physics replicating the results is much easier than in uh, experimental physics because in experimental physics it usually takes uh, dec years if not decades to replicate uh, the results of an experiment for example um, recently the sun no in Fermilab the results showed that the standard model has a weakness uh, because the W boson is much lighter than it should have been but to replicate the results of that experiment they need to redo everything in the Large Hadron Collider, which may take a few years um, or maybe up to a decade. But to replicate the results of my experiment, all you have to do is run my code in the browser. Which will probably take a millisecond or less. So you can see that... Uh, there are a lot of differences. Yeah, different fields of physics have different kind of you know, structures for replicating the experiments for writing the methodologies and all of that. That's interesting. So thank you everybody for watching. I'm sure you've taught a lot of people today, including me. Now I know more how uh, papers work, how you can uh, replicate results, how, what each uh, section of the paper means. Because before I was really just jumping into the papers. I was really clueless about what every sex section meant. So mm. thank you. Do you have any ideas for papers you want to write? Not yet, but I'm sure I soon will. Thank you. Well, actually, if you oh. here are a few ideas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just look around the world and, and try to observe phenomena that might not have been described in other papers. For example, if you look through a polarized light filter, you will see that there's a rainbow-like halo around the sun. If you, as I gave in the previous example, if you look through a straw submerged in a, in a tub of water, you'll see that the other end of the straw is diluted or it looks like it's blocked. Oh, the past there. two, my brother actually observed uh, while uh, in everyday situations. Yeah, that. he observed it uh, when we were on our road trip. He observed it while we were at a restaurant. Uh, how uh, when you look down a, a, um, a straw, mm -hmm. then the other end seems blurry. And also, the same thing with that rainbow thing, he always looks up uh, at the sun, the, what do you call it, the sun window, I'll say. Yeah, it's a and, polarized filter. Yeah, and, and, to, and he always sees this rainbow ring around the sun. And uh, it's a really interesting phenomena. And when he sees these kinds of phenomena, he always jokes, oh, I could write a paper about this. Yeah. So, so always try to be curious about your world. <coughs> try to uh, observe things that other people haven't observed. And uh, maybe you'll discover something that no one else has discovered. Maybe you'll come up with your own theory.